All right, what would I do without you, my support system? Okay, so let's see now. No, you can go play with Maddie. Okay, uh, let's see now. Let's make sure my browser's all looking pretty good there. I think it is. I close that. Um, still got the Padlet from Econ in there. And let's see how this will work. So I'm just gonna do app share. Is that screen share? Anybody, is there any other better way to do it? Screen share. Chrome. Okay, so there's my Chrome being shared. This is a very short intro video. Let's see how it works. Can you hear the sound? No, you can't hear the sound of the video. You had to, you had to go into settings um, to make it work. To the Zoom settings. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Someone told me how to do it before. Um, Sorry, I'm not prepared with this. Share sound. Let's try that. Yes. Sort of a disco theme there. Techno, disco. Cool. And what if I go full screen? What happens to that? Mine kind of froze. That's full screen mode. Student Jada. All right, we got another student joining us. Welcome. So that was just hi everyone. Welcome to the. That was just our little test, test um, video. I think I'll actually play that again. So this is just like a little, um, kind of a quick teaser. And then um, we're gonna go into some longer videos. So these guys are Clean Technica, they're a YouTube channel. Um, the one guy is out of Holland, but I think there's some American guys that collaborate on it too. They do a lot of great um, clean tech sort of news and things like that. There they Hi, are. Everyone. That's Welcome Clean Technica, first... but we're not going to watch that one right now. Okay, someone else is trying to get in. I'll figure that out in a second. Let's try this. Admit. So this one is. Watch me do my thing. Let's get back. Okay, so that last one was um, called the Tesla Tesla Fremont Factory Sneak Preview. So that's just some imagery and. And this next one is six minutes long. It's called How Tesla Builds Cars So Fast. And this is a really interesting YouTube channel called Tech Vision. They have amazing videos and the guy's got this great British accent. Super mysterious though. I tried to figure out who Tech Vision is. They do all these like futuristic kind of um, little doc mini documentaries on YouTube. It's a YouTube channel. But I, st I haven't put that much time researching into it, but I cannot figure out who Tech Vision is. It's very mysterious. So if anyone's like into investigating things and wants to try to figure out who owns and manages and directs this YouTube channel, I'd be super curious to know. Tesla is currently capable of turning out about 5,000 electric vehicles each week on a maximum capacity, which is a huge leap forward from this time last year, yet far from the estimated figures of this time next year. The rate of production has grown has been exponential, and this has been partly due to the surging demand for electric cars and the increase in interest and popularity for the brand. But how has Tesla, a very young company compared to the established brands, succeeded in ramping up its production in such little time? To understand how, we must first understand why, and we're faced with the time-old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. In this instance, we ask whether the interest in stepping away from fossil fuels came to light first, or whether it was the launch of companies like Tesla which introduced new possibilities.
possibilities that fueled the pro-electric anti-fossil fuel debate. Regardless, Tesla was a huge success with wealthy customers hitting the mass market in the early 2010s with its Model S. By the end of the decade, the affordable Model 3 meant electric cars could be put in the hands of many average consumers. Opening up this door created a huge surge in sales for Tesla, putting CEO Elon Musk under incredible stress to meet targets that, a few years back, would have been frankly unachievable. A new plan of action needed to be devised, and quickly. Elon Musk first implemented autonomy in his factories on a large scale with the production of the Model S later in 2017. But this was deemed to be unsuccessful, as are many first attempts at anything, especially this challenging. Nevertheless, the factory was a far cry from its state in 2010 when purchased from General Motors. But when the Model 3 launched and demand skyrocketed, it was time for the company to have another crack at speeding up the process. In a haste to assemble more cars, and at quite a precarious time for the company financially, the company is assembled a giant tent outside its factory in Fremont, California. This allowed about a quarter of a million Model 3s to exit the facility in 2019 alone. The production line was designed to be simple, with many parts entering this final stage pre-assembled and shelf ready. It will be a case then of fitting an entire seat assembly rather than the frame, the material and the stitching. Footage shows entire dashboards being installed, with the infotainment display already in place. The production line is made up of just 43 steps, which is said to be between a quarter and a third of the amount of steps employed in traditional auto manufacturing. It may come as no surprise that the futuristic warehouses are full of robots. Robots employ the Model 3 body shop. They're said to improve accuracy while reducing the time spent on each vehicle. So far, this has been true. It's said that panel gaps have notably improved, which put the current generation of Teslas in line with the Germans, which are said to be the golden standard of manufacturing. So on top of this, the car bodies exit the process a lot more clean. This means that fewer imperfections and inconsistencies to texture and tone are seen on the raw metalwork before the paint is applied, helping to deliver premium quality. While the robots help the cars go from an empty shell to a functioning vehicle in as little as 90 minutes along a short 1,000-foot journey, Musk hasn't cut all star from its factories. There are certain jobs humans can do better than machines, include looking after the machines themselves. Musk famously said that you can't have people in the production line itself, otherwise you drop to people's speed. What he means by this is that the production line can only work as fast as its slowest component. And with humans being the slowest component of any production line, he aims to eradicate them where possible. People will maintain the machines, upgrade them, and deal with anomalies, he said. Currently, only the human brain is capable enough of problem solving. Elon Musk's goal for 2020 and the years to follow is to produce 1 million cars per year. And although this year looks to be a figure around half that, it's safe to say it's been anything but a normal year. Still, a 36% increase over the previous year is nothing to be ashamed of. To produce the world's population of Model 3s from a tent in California would be impossible, which is why production will be spread globally to satisfy various markets. It's been mentioned that there could even be a gigafactory located in each... In and that might not be a distant dream. The Shanghai-based warehouse was built on an empty plot, entirely from the ground up, in less than a year, and its Berlin counterpart is expected to open its doors even quicker. While many automakers outsource many stages of their vehicle's production, such as stamping, which involves bending the metal panels into shape, Tesla aims to cut the costs by doing all of this in-house. Musk openly admits that there have been teething problems with the new autonomous style of assembly. There have been instances where steps have had to be repeated, for example, after an error spotted by human eye has been identified. But the process relies heavily on artificial intelligence and machine learning, which both help the self-healing of any errors and induce constant improvement. We know the company has the ability to collect masses of data about its cars and their users, but what is discussed less so is that it collects much of its data from itself, including its assembly machinery. Even so, autonomy and robotics are in their infancies. Developing things like computer vision, which refers to how a computer sees and interacts with its environment, will help increase the production line's dependency on these, which although incur huge upfront cost, are cheaper in the long term to employ. Various visits have taken place in Tesla factories, and the results have been promising. Many write or talk of their positive experiences and report on the reality of the autonomous machinery's efficiency. Some have suggested that the company could easily accommodate a 10,000 weekly production figure in the very close future with a little tweaking and growth, and that's just from one factory. 
We must also remember that, for many of its first years, Tesla was building and adapting processes just like these behind closed doors when the company wasn't so much in the public eye. Being somewhere between a car and a tech company, Tesla works remarkably different to any other car manufacturer. Not only is CEO Elon Musk writing a new way of assembling cars, but he is rewriting the process for the entire industry. Pioneering at the forefront of this new era, it's only a matter of time before we see other car companies adopt a similar process. Although customers are waiting weeks and sometimes months for the latest model, much of this time is spent in the shipping phase, and that's after the backlog of other people's orders has been cleared. The car itself is ready in as little as three to five days. That means when more facilities are in place globally, ownership could happen in just a few weeks, and who knows, maybe one day, just days. All of this is truly impressive, but what's most important to you when you buy your next car? Reduced waiting times and associated costs are a huge benefit financially, but at the loss of potentially thousands of assembly jobs. Or maybe it's time for the auto manufacturing industry to catch up with production lines in other industries, which have already become more reliant on autonomy. We're back. This is Lusana. She's five. And <clears throat> Groovy. Okay, so you can see some of the other things that I watch on YouTube. Um, okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, that was super cool. I didn't know that they're a completely automated um, factory. Pretty, pretty amazing. That's that's a lot of pretty old footage, and we're gonna watch. Some, okay, not, not. Are you gonna Are you gonna take us there when we're in person again? Yeah, I think we should set up one at the Fremont factory. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that's um, only like 20 minutes from my house. So. Yeah, I know. It's only about an hour and 15 from my house. Hour and 30, actually, something like Depending on traffic, it could be four hours. But anyway. Well, I'll buy you lunch if you go, OK? I, I would gladly go. And for those of you who have driver's license, all you have to do is um, Go to the tesla.com website and you can test drive their vehicles for free it's totally uh, non-human engagement i i set it up there's a place in santa rosa and i it was like a bed and breakfast and i showed up there and there's just two teslas parked in the parking lot and they just do it by the phone like all over the phone they just like they unlock the car for you over the air uh, and then he's like, okay, you can get in the car now. And I get in the car. I brought my wife and Lusana, the little one. And, um, <clears throat> and I just, I got an hour, they gave me an hour each. It's almost like a free hour rental car. Um, and I got to drive two different types of Teslas for an hour each. It was super, super fun. And, um, yeah, so you can do that for free. I heard that, so, that the new ones that they're releasing are going to zero to 90 in less than a second, which is mind blowing. Yeah, they have the fastest car ever, ever made. It's not out yet. Like you can't, you can't buy it quite yet, but it's been produced like uh, the prototypes and they've been testing it. It's, it's the fastest production car ever made. It beats like Ferraris and, and, um, and all that kind of stuff. And they also are the, t the safest cars ever made. Um, they're the top four, top three or four safest cars ever made. And less maintenance too, right? Because it has, has less maintenance too because you don't have a piston engine. Um, yeah, way less so maintenance. Less maintenance. No, no oil changes and you don't have to put gas in it. And Lusana wants me to tell you about the pickup truck. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The pickup truck. Well, I think... The Cybertruck, yeah, we're gonna hopefully see something about that. So she's been indoctrinated, indoctrinated into the Tesla cult. Um, but let's watch another video. So this one is, this is a 15 minute video. This is a Tesla tact factory tour. There were some clips from the, in the last one, but um, this is a more detailed tour of the factory. Um, it's from 2018, but it's the most recent full video of, that, of a tour. Um, that's done like professionally. So um, someone else needs to get in there, but I think the pandemic has really um, slowed that kind of stuff down. Okay. It's a full menagerie over here.
Hey, what is up guys? I'm Kabeach here and welcome to the sequel to the previous video. So the part two, which is the mini factory tour with Elon. Uh, I want to preface it just with the intro by saying, first of all, it is really difficult to shoot good video in that factory. As you'll both see in here, it's extremely loud and extremely busy. So this is more of just like a walking around and having fun and checking things out. Uh, it's it's actually probably just like 15 or 20% of the actual Model S and X factory process. It's not the whole thing. It's mostly just Elon showing us around. And uh, in fact, I didn't even really say much during this interview. It was more just like a, I was kind of like a kid in the matrix just kind of absorbing everything. And then it also kind of cuts abruptly at the end when Elon basically gets pulled into his next meeting. But I still thought it was a ton of fun and worth sharing. And also, I should mention this entire video shoot, this production would not be possible without my buddy John from the TLD channel and his crew who helped with audio, who were the muscle with the steady cam. He has an entire behind the scenes video of this process on his channel. I'll link that right below. So if you wanna check that out after watching this in part one, feel free. But until the next one, this is your mini tour of the Tesla factory with Elon. Enjoy. One that loops back and like I said, just gives, gives us access to the central corridor. Yeah. Um, so it's really just like lifting it up and over. So the, the car that ends up here came all the way down this previous? Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. So it's, like, these robots are really just to give us ac uh, like through, through oh. access. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's going to pick it up and transfer it to the other robot. Yeah. Um, but I, I think like, uh, you know, like a design improvement we should do is like really just the one robot should just pass it to the other robot. Um, just pick it up. Yeah, oh, like, there's a third one above us. Yeah, it's like it puts it on a table, the table rotates. It's like, like if we do this, if we did this over, we would just have that giant robot pass it to that giant robot. Fair. Yeah. Hand off. Yeah. There's like, right. it's like a thousands of like little things like that that help improve production. General Assembly kind of operates in kind of a U, so it goes cars come in over there, go all the way down here, and then all the way that way. Okay. Um, and uh, you can see the car get progressively more complex as it goes down the general assembly line. What does it look like when it starts this side of the assembly line? Oh, we can go there. Can All we right, go there? let's do should it. Should we start there? Start at the beginning? Yeah, or... might as well. But here you can get a good sense for, there's like, like general assembly is what I was talking about as being really well suited to people. Okay. Uh, because you got a lot of weird things that you got to put together. Like, you can like look at some of these, um, you know, assemblies that like, like it's pretty hard for a robot to like connect this on. That makes sense. Yeah, it's, you know, and like depending upon how it comes out of the box, it could be like in a little different position, but it's pretty easy for somebody like, oh, it's uh, it's like, I just need to move it like an inch, you know, bolt it in. It's no probably really hard to write software to yeah. kind of know, to yeah. adapt in all these different ways. Yeah, so if you try to, order, if you try to have the robot do this, you gotta have like a complicated vision system, and then like the vision system bolts out, it's like, it's not quite right. That's um, the hard part. We we have a, a robot in our studio that moves the camera around, and the hardest part is when it faults. Yeah. You need a person there to know what to do. Exactly. So hopefully that doesn't happen much. Um, like for, for parts that are that are complicated and fiddly, like uh, wiring harnesses are especially difficult. You see how like the wiring harness kind of meets the snake uh, through the car. Yeah. It's it's literally like like winding like a snake through the car. Yeah. You got to like poke it through holes and and do, do various things. That's super difficult for a robot. See like how they're like putting the, uh, yeah, the part of the air conditioning system there? Right. Um, so you use like a little bit of mechanical assistance with the winch and whatnot, but then it's pretty straightforward for the guys to just like get that in there. And then like, if they see there's an issue with the part, then like they say, oh, this part's got a problem. We'll like, we'll put it over here for, to, you know, um, to get fixed. Like this is like semi lines like moving slowly. Yeah. So like moves along. Um, and then if, um, you know, it gives people like time to, to get things done. Like you can like stand on this and I and think you work. mentioned like the, the speed of the car coming out the other side is like one mile an hour or something like that. Yeah, it's super slow. You want to speed this up, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not even one mile an hour. It's even slower than that right now. But for SX, but for, for three, it's like getting close to a mile an hour. Okay, okay. Um, but like walking speed is three miles an hour, so it's like only one third walking speed at one mile an hour. All right. But you can see like, when you look on the inside of the car, you can see like how many little complicated little pieces there are. A lot. Um, you know, but the things that are meant to, uh, for insulation, corrosion protection, um, airbags, uh, uh, road noise, like it's all this stuff that gets put in here. Yeah. And you can see like these are like the side airbags here. 
Okay. Um, I must be. That looks like pretty cool. Like most people never see like the inside of the car. Yeah, there's a million things you never see yeah. driving the car every day. Sure. This is like. Sorry, guys. Sorry to interrupt. That's how it makes me look. Well, if you don't mind being on like, on like you know the internet and stuff, is okay. that cool? All right. YouTube's cool. I actually don't interrupt your work, but. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like, you see like how like there's like a lot of tricky pieces and like if for a person, like this is like durable. Straightforward. Yeah, you know, it takes a bit of training, get up speed, whatever, but like once, once you like, um, basically like a, like a pro human can do this super well and it's like hard for the robots to do that. But I, when we go to the, the, like the body welding, I'll show you yeah. like what's, like what's a robot good at. And awesome. you'll see like there's tons of robots, like tons of people here, tons of robots there. Um, but there's so much complexity and variation here. Um, you gotta like thread those wires when it comes through. Especially like, here, yeah. with this door. So, so like, this, this is a car with like less stuff in it, and then it goes. It's you know, we'll, and we'll see the beginning of it. Right. And then that, then it goes all the way around, gets more and more stuff added. And Does then, it end at the end? Of, well, general assembly ends probably yeah. somewhere down there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Um, but you can see, it's interesting to see the car get progressively more complex as we add more parts to it. You know, this place uh, used to employ like about 5,000 people, uh -huh. and now we got like we got we got 10,000 people just in this location. Yeah. So what we do is we have like tons of shuttles and like uh, we encourage ride sharing. Yeah. Uh, we got the very rapid transit station finally like went went up. Um, so just like trying to get people here is is not easy. It's a big challenge. Yeah. What is this? Oh, this is uh, actually like this is one of my favorite dumb robots. Okay. Yeah. I'm a fan right now. It's pretty cool. Um, so like there's a lot of fancy robots uh, that like, but they have like lots of issues and they break down all the time. But these little guys are super great. But like, they follow this magnetic stripe. Uh -huh. See basically it's like super easy to program. You don't even need to be a programmer. Because just like lay down the, the, the mag stripe. And it'll follow it. Yeah, it just follows the mag stripe and That's then it's it. got uh, proximity sensors in the front. So. If, if it sees an obstacle or sees like something in the way, it just stops. And then as soon as something moves out of the way, it just keeps going. You know, just like, does this like little thing all day long, like a little train. And, like you're talking about robots faulting out. And one of the, it's like, that's like where, like actually um, doing things manually can, can, can actually be more, um, more efficient because if you have like a lot of complicated robots, particularly if you have a 24 seven operation like we have with Model 3, uh, then if robot faults out, you got to have 24/7 like advanced robot technicians. Makes sense. And then if the robot uh, like accidentally crashes and like breaks a fixture, then it's like man, okay, now we're, now we've got the line, we've got the line down. It's Do you like have to red alert, and then I get pulled on my cell phone at two in the morning, and it's yeah, like yeah, not a lot like, of fun. Fly apart from Germany. It's like we literally had that two days ago. Do you have <laughs> to when you get new robots? Do you build the robots or do you order them in and program them? Uh, so. Uh, there's like different classes. There's many, many different types of robots. So, yeah. the like the giant robot that we saw lifting the car yeah. is like a, that's that that is a catalog item. But then we have to program the the, the motions, right. um, and then and the end effector is that is custom. Okay. So the end effector that picks up the car, drops it off. That's a custom made uh, thing. Okay. So it's kind of like you you kind of like buy this like powerful arm, but yeah. it's just like having an arm stuck in the ground, and then you're like, okay, what does the arm do? You got to tell it everything to do. Yeah. Okay. And then you got to put sensors on it and put fixtures. But that's like kind of uh, like that robot over there. Uh, that's also one of like the ones that picks up the car. Oh, uh, by the way, these are like named after X Men. Oh yeah, okay. I forgot yeah. about that. Um, Just X Men? I, I feel like you like might have Marvel, too many. It's like Marvel and X Men. It's like you got to start to run out of names. Yeah, yeah. This like actually turns out a lot of X Men, by the way. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so you can see like this is like quite a beast of a robot. You can just buy that robot. You know, in this case, it's a Fanuc robot, um, and uh, you can buy the robot, but then the end effector that's carrying the car um, is something that's custom, and then you got to do the programming and the, like, wire in the sensors and that kind of thing. So. To the, the level of precision of this massive robot, is it to, like, as far as repeatable action, is it literally the same path every cent? Yeah. Plus or minus an inch? Oh, no, it's... Uh, Centimeter? It's, it's better than that. It, it, for a big robot, there's a little less precision than a smaller robot. Yeah. But say a medium-sized robot will be accurate to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters. Oh, okay. What is the most popular paint color coming through here? That's black. Black? Yeah. It actually varies by 
country. Um, oh, interesting. Like, um, watch out! There's a dumb robot coming through. Oh yeah, no, this guy's like pretty, pretty cool. Like, watch. <laughs> All right, this could go wrong. I don't know. You trust him more than I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. All okay. Right. All right. Good job. <laughs> Good job, robot. Yeah. No, I, I see a lot of silver, and I see a lot of white Model X. Yeah, Just yeah, in so, New Jersey. Uh, black and white are the two most colors, the uh, two most popular colors. Okay. Um, the white and black are, are like black slight is is slightly more popular than white in the U.S. But in like Europe, it's way more popular. Like white is a very rare color in Europe for a car. Okay. Um, in the U.S., it's like it's it's about even with with black. Black and white are the two most common colors. Got yeah. it. And here you can see battery pack. This is like this be like a mating station for the battery pack. Oh, this is literally connecting the battery to the yeah. car. Here you can see it's like a combination of manual and automatic. So it's looks like they're lining it's, it up. It's like yeah, exactly. It's a it's it's done primarily by the robot system, by the automated system. But then you've got a person just making sure that the fine tuning is there. Gotcha. How do you feel about matte? matte or satin colors I actually going to ask about that a lot. I actually like the aesthetics of matte. Uh -huh. It's really tricky to, to repair matte. So like okay, with glass, yeah. you can polish it out. With yeah. matte, um, if you get like a little ding, it's really hard to then rematch the, so it looks like an even matte. Yeah. You can't just like, you know. That's a fair point, yeah. Um, so it's, it's doable. It's, it's something actually we would like to do matte in the future. Um, but, um, like right now, for example, like pa the paint shop's really operating at full tilt, so adding any complexity to the paint shop would not be wise right now, but right. I think it'd be a cool thing to do in the future. So these are sub-assemblies, so you can see like the front and rear drive units being built up, yeah. and the sub-assemblies then feed the main assembly line. These are a long assembly line. Oh yeah. Well, it's, and it's, it's integrating uh, S and X. Okay. And it's making about 2,000 cars a week. Is Model 3 entirely, completely separate? I guess yes. inside the same building, but separate the, whole uh, process. The only place where Model 3 uh, and S and X come together is in the paint shop. So the paint shop is processing S3 and X um, simultaneously down the same line. Gotcha. Uh, but otherwise, general assembly is separate, body separate. Um, yeah, everything else is separate. So just the paint shop where they come together. You've mentioned you've slept in the factory to be able to immediately like diagnose problems and hands-on fix what's not right. What type of things happen that you can immediately fix or immediately take action on? Actually, last, last three months last year, I mostly spent at Giga Factory um, uh, trying to uh, help fix the battery production. It's a module production. Um, and it's just, it's a lot of little things, like looking at, 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 each, uh, at each little, little tiny part each process, say is the process necessary? Like, because the best part is no part, best part of process is no process. And occasionally at the design level, you think something's necessary, but then it turns out it's not. So it's just like making sure, connect, connecting between design um, and manufacturing. Uh, make sure, make sure we close the loop on that. Um, uh, just saying like, hey, is, is this, if it, let's say it's a, 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 it's like, a, it's a lot of real simple stuff, but it's like times, times a thousand. Yeah. So, if we have like a automated bolt driver going in, like what's the RPM and torque settings for the bolt driver? Um, can we make that go faster? Uh, usually, usually can. Unnecessary movements, um, like like for example, I actually don't really like the fact that we lift the cars over and and, and back. Um, yeah. it, Ideally, it, that would be a robot handoff. Yeah, if you're robot, getting rid of a middle stage. Yeah, exactly. Because the middle stage, what's the is like putting it on a turntable. And then the turntable is rotating, and the other robot's picking it up. It's actually the problem is like sometimes the turntable breaks down, oh. and and so okay, so it's like okay, let's eliminate the turntable and just have a robot go to robot, um, and then you don't have like uh, turntable breakage to consider. So it's a lot uh, of minimizing things that can go wrong, and maximizing the efficiency of the simple things that go it's, right. It's like um, design, like design necessity of, of every part of it and, and every process. Yeah. Uh, the, the speed at which, um, especially the robots are going. Um, are there, um, 
Are there any, is, is there any unnecessary movement in the production line that, that isn't value added, like we're not actually doing something? Yeah. Um, for, like replacing part, uh, elements of the production system that are not... Um, not needed or redundant. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, that was cool, and I want someone to make an updated version of that so that we can have the latest, the latest, greatest um, information. Tesla is actually building, they just finished building uh, what they call a gigafactory in China, in Shanghai, and um, they have the largest casting machine in the world there. And um, it's like seven stories high, built a uh, seven story high um, machine. And then um, they're also building a gigafactory in Texas, in Austin, Texas, and Berlin, Germany. So there's a lot of exciting. Okay, what's happening here? Is someone else trying to get in? I'm getting some sort of, oh, chat. Someone's chatting. Okay, I'll check that out in a moment. Maybe, maybe it's someone telling me they can't hear me, so I should probably look at it right now. Chat, where did the chat go? Chat. Whoa. And um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so this next video is shorter. Oh, this is cool. Okay, so like I said, that last thing, was, that last video was from 2018. This one is from just a few days ago. This. Um, this video was put out on February 28th and of just last month, and it's about Tesla Autopilot. And um, so this is Tesla Autopilot, which is already released, but um, they've released a beta version of the full self-driving technology. So if you go on YouTube and you, and you search for Tesla full self-driving FSD, you will see um, videos that people have videoed like with their phone or a GoPro camera of themselves driving and how the car drives itself. Um, but this is gonna show kind of how that technology works. Um, so just to be clear, the full self-driving is not released to the full fleet of the all the cars that Tesla has made, just a select few people that their, um, their AI has designate, uh, identified as really safe drivers. And they've been giving these people um, over the air software updates so that they have full self-driving. Um, and so that's how this, that's how some of this footage came from, I believe. Um, and let's check it out. So this is a nine minute video on how autopilot works. And that's what Ms. Carol, what you were talking about the other day when we were discussing this. So it's called autopilot, but the next version will be called full self-driving just to clarify those two things. And here we go. Hi, I'm David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Thank goodness 2020 is behind us. This is a good organization to donate to. I donated to them, so they're advertising to me a lot. It helps refugees. Even the most ardent Elon Musk stan will admit their lord and saviour hasn't exactly delivered on his promise of properly autonomous self-driving vehicles. Yet, anyway, Tesla's flamboyant CEO has repeatedly suggested we'd be there by now, and frankly, we aren't. But the so-called autopilot feature available on all modern Teslas is quite a marvellous feat of engineering nonetheless. What enables it to detect hazards up ahead? How does it then go about making sense of that information? Is it better at driving than human beings? Join us today as we pop the metaphorical hood and take a peek into to how autopilot actually works. For an eye-opening introduction to just how sophisticated Tesla's driving algorithm has become of late, take a look at this video released back in January 2020. Merging input from an array of smart sensory devices, the car's onboard computer is clearly capable of identifying and tracking its fellow vehicles on the road in real time. Not only that, it's able to differentiate between an impressive range of other potential hazards besides. Everything from lane lines and painted arrows to crossings, stop signs, trash cans, the incline 
of the road up ahead and even random puddles are all noted and addressed. At least as quickly, crucially, as a human being could spot these things. So how does it do it? At the most basic level, visual feedback is fed into the system via Tesla's eight onboard cameras. Three of these are mounted on the windscreen, each slightly different from the other and suitable for very different ranges. The car's main front-facing camera is calibrated for visual recognition up to 150 meters. There's also a wide-angled camera that can see more broadly up to a range of 60 meters and a narrow field camera which peers into the distance as far away as 250 meters. In addition, there's four more regular cameras mounted on each side of the vehicle. Two are slanted rearward and another two are angled forward for merging and maneuvering into tight spots. And finally, there's a rear camera, which itself boasts a range of up to 50 meters, used both as a run-of-the-mill parking camera and another data source feeding crucial situational data back to the central computer. These cameras, whose visual fields overlap, providing the necessary redundancy which is a cornerstone of Tesla's safe design philosophy, are only part of the picture. A front-facing radar that detects objects up to 160 meters away by bouncing radio waves off of them is a key component in the sensor array. It's reported that Tesla is currently planning to integrate a radar with twice that range into its newer models, with slicker processing capacity courtesy of cutting-edge radar design by Israeli tech startup Arbor Robotics. Tesla's fondness for radar is actually a controversial topic within the fledgling autonomous car industry. Most other companies working to bring similar vehicles to market, think Ford, GM or Waymo, prefer so-called LiDAR, which is similar to radar except it bounces light off of objects in order to ascertain their distance and form. At Tesla's Autonomy Day last year, Elon Musk offered this scathing critique of LiDAR technology. LiDAR is a fool's errand, he informed a wrapped crowd. Anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. They are expensive sensors that are unnecessary, his rant continued. It's like having a whole bunch of expensive appendices. Like, one appendix is bad, well now you have a whole bunch of them. It's ridiculous, you'll see. Although LiDAR's prohibitively high cost was one reason why radar was preferred by Tesla early on, Musk doubled down on his loathing for the medium in October, even as the price of LiDAR started to fall. Even if LiDAR was free, we wouldn't put it on, he thundered. Not least because LiDAR is notoriously unreliable in rainy or dusty conditions. Teslas are also fitted with 12 small dots situated around the car, each of which provides essential short-range sensory input, up to about 8 meters, through the magic of ultrasound. This medium provides Tesla with what has been described as a protective cocoon around the vehicle, enabling it to detect when an object, a crash barrier say, or a dog, is getting too close for comfort. Working together in concert, this imaginative fusion of conventional cameras, sophisticated radar and 360-degree ultrasound help Teslas stay finely attuned to their surroundings. Add that to the car's ultra-precise GPS tracking and world-class mapping systems, and you have a vehicle that's substantially smarter than most human beings at assessing where it is and what's going on out there on the mean streets. Of course, when it comes to safe motoring, sensory input is only part of the story. So how is all that lovely data organized and processed? With his characteristic knack for modest understatement, Elon Musk has described the new processor at the beating heart of his iconic car as the best chip in the world. Tesla's so-called full self-driving chip, shipped in all new models, is a 260 square millimeter chunk of prime Samsung silicon boasting no fewer than 6 billion transistors. Each chip, there's two aboard, again ensuring that all-important redundancy, is capable of performing some 26 trillion operations a second. This means it can respond in real time to any of the multifarious hazards brought to its attention from that smart sensory array we talked about just now. There's more. Alongside the humdrum pre-programmed aspects of Tesla's driving algorithm, speed limits, stop signs and the like, the car's silicon brain also has the ability to learn. And learn it most certainly does. Not only from its own native experience, fed by those sensors, but from data harvested across the entire global fleet of Teslas and their own sensor arrays. Every single Tesla on the road, and the company manufactured half a million of them in 2020 alone, collects detailed information on its environment and feeds it back to HQ for other motorists to subconsciously make use of. Despite this system's obvious brilliance, it has upset some, who are reportedly suspicious of Tesla's so-called shadow mode. Their beef is the fact their pricey new model, when in shadow mode, essentially pretends to be an autonomous vehicle. As in, it makes, but never executes, a driving plan based on the data available to it and reports back to HQ whenever its plan deviates from that of the real flesh-and-blood driver. This is, of course, designed to reflect 
refine and improve the algorithm and fulfill Elon Musk's dream of deploying autonomy at scale. Still, it bugs people from a privacy point of view, and perhaps they have a point. So how autonomous actually are the latest Teslas? They're shipped with all the hardware Elon Musk reckons is necessary for achieving the self-driving dream. But for now, the furthest towards that ambition these cars actually get is Tesla's so-called autopilot mode. The newest enhanced bells and whistles autopilot mode, which Tesla drivers can order over the air for a princely $8,000 as an optional extra, offers dynamic traffic-aware cruise control. Customers can also get automatic lane changing for their spend, which can respond to either sat-nav route plans or an impulsive manual flick of the turn signal. Owners also get the fun ultimate bragging rights feature of Smart Summon. However, all these come with caveats. Smart Summon, which in theory enables Tesla drivers to flick a button on the app and summon their shiny motor from its parking space to wherever they're proudly standing, is only recommended for use on private driveways. And despite that slick traffic-aware cruise control system, which maintains speeds until the vehicle ahead slows or stops, drivers are still legally required to keep their hands on the wheel at basically all times in order to take over should anything go awry. The car will complain and ultimately stop altogether if hands aren't on the wheel constantly. Not exactly autonomous. Autonomy in vehicles is currently rated on an internationally recognized 1 to 5 scale. At so-called level 1 automation, a single aspect of driving is automated. For instance, traffic-aware cruise control. This has been around for quite a few years now. At the other end of the scale, level 5 automation promises the ultimate fantasy of full vehicular autonomy, meaning the driver can catch up on emails, watch the scenery, or simply enjoy a well-earned nap. Right now, Tesla is reluctantly marooned at level 2, with only a couple of aspects of their driving experience automated, most notably speed control and lane changing. Modern Teslas are technically quite capable of, say, taking an exit ramp and moving between highways, but legal and regulatory edicts insist that a person still be in charge at the wheel at all times. And this is quite right and proper, by the way, for now at least. Tragic failures can and do happen, like the passing of 38-year-old Apple employee Walter Huang, whose Tesla on autopilot mode slammed into a concrete barrier while he was reportedly playing on his phone. In March 2019, 50-year-old Jerry Jeremy Bear and Banner's Model 3 slammed into a tractor trailer attempting to cross a Florida highway at 68 miles per hour, shearing the roof clean off his car and sadly ending his life. So despite its undeniable sophistication and the bullish predictions of Elon Musk, Autopilot isn't quite ready yet. Supporters will point out, rightly perhaps, that self-driving Teslas are on the whole better than human drivers. Certainly they never get drunk or tired or stressed. Still, each and every tragic mishap in even the most vaguely autonomous vehicle sets back progress by months, if not years. It's probably fair to trust that Elon Musk's brainchild, an ingenious mixture of smart sensors, lightning-fast AI and crowdsourced machine learning, will get us where we're going eventually. What do you think? Should regulators lighten up and grant Tesla more autonomous freedom? In its current form, does Tesla's setup even deserve the name Autopilot? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to hit subscribe for more freewheeling tech content. Freewheeling. Okay, is anybody inspired to figure out who this tech vision is and why are they producing? It's only natural to dwell on what we've missed. It's celebration. And why are they producing these awesome and videos without friends. telling us who they are? <clears throat> so the mystery of tech vision. So that was another tech vision video. I think this is supposed to be a whole hour, right? So we got time for. <clears throat> <sighs> Let's, uh, I got some other like factory tour stuff, but I want to show you something that's more fun, which is the cyber truck video. We won't be able to watch the whole thing because there is some, um, let's see here. We won't watch the whole thing, but, um, it's, just, it's a fun one to uh, check out. So this is the truck that they, introduced about a year ago i ordered one i've never had a new car before but um i'm banking on the full self-driving feature making it an investment where i can make money from my um autonomous taxi um they haven't even finished the factory in texas yet that's going to be building these trucks so i probably won't get my car for another year um so i i ordered a car that's going to be one and a half to two years coming. They have um, over 600,000 orders for these cars, uh, these trucks. And so let's see, this will be our last video.
Los Angeles, November 29. It's pausing. It's frozen for me. So I'm going to try to pause it for a minute and let it um, catch up. What's that called? Buffering. I think it's buffering. The skies are polluted. The world is addicted to oil. But we're here to offer a solution. The cyber truck. The number one mode of transport for a cyber girl. The greatest evolution in vehicular fashion and function. As Tesla's Cybertruck continues to break the internet, we might invest in how to find explaining why the Cybertruck is pure genius, what it means for Tesla's bottom line. First of all, the Cybertruck had to look the way that it does. There's been endless talk and debate about the polarizing design, but everyone seems to be missing an important fact. Its form is a manifestation of Or four key criteria Tesla had in its creation. The Cybertruck must be low cost to produce and therefore to buy, have extremely high utility and performance, more than any comparable vehicles, be very efficient, aerodynamic, light, and be safe. Let's look at each of those in detail. Low cost. The cheaper a vehicle is to produce, the cheaper it can be sold, which expands its market and or the better its margins can be. The Cybertruck is a real visual example of what removing complexity from a vehicle design does. The process of manufacturing a vehicle is extremely complicated. Production hell, anyone? There are literally thousands of moving parts. The Cybertruck has been engineered to be extremely efficient to manufacture. This is very important. There isn't a single curve in sight for a reason. The glass is flat. The body, a stainless steel exoskeleton, is folded from a single flat sheet of steel. Its sturdiness eliminates the need for a vehicle frame, freeing up space and weight. There are no stamping machines stamping body panels. There is no paint shop. In fact, let's look at a video from Wired a few years back showing how the Model S body is produced. Just to remind you, the Cybertruck body, its exoskeleton, is created from a single sheet of steel which is laser cut, scored and folded, done and dusted in one process. And then with these pieces, we feed them to the press lines, these gigantic dies. And the press lines essentially form the panels, you know, boom. With the Cybertruck, everything you just saw has become a single process. Those gigantic stamping machines and special tooling machines are really freaking expensive and slow. Cybertruck doesn't need them. The time and... All right. At the first sign of semi-profanity, I'm going to stop it because um, this guy has sometimes has a tendency to use um, foul language uh, in his enthusiasm. And so I'm, I'm going to stop here, but um, you can look this up if you are over 17 and would like to watch this video. It's rated R. So thank you everyone for coming today. That's it, if anyone has any questions or comments, um, please feel free to make them now. And, um, and I'm gonna turn off uh, the recording in a moment, unless someone wants to get on, uh, wants to get on there. 
You're welcome. Um, yeah, I think we had we had like elementary students. Anybody in middle school? All right, cool. Thanks for coming today. That's awesome. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, there's many more videos on YouTube. Um, if you want to do further research and if anyone can figure out who Tech Vision is, please email me. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there interested in investigations and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can figure out how to stop the recording. Stop recording. <laughs>